Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii today on Monday, February 15th. Uh, this show is the state of the state of Hawaii, which airs on alternate Mondays. I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll, Stoll Dalton. Um, this show brings news of events and issues in our state with guests to share their experience, their expertise and experience and viewpoints on business, government, economics, law, public health policy, and safety, transportation, and also education. Today's show focuses on education, specifically teaching. Hawaii's diverse public school classrooms have for decades welcomed out-of-state teachers, developed skilled local teachers, and partnered with private, state, and federal educational research programs to improve local students' school success. Reports of that work's success point to classroom teaching that increases student talk and participation opportunities especially in, 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 needy, uh, in schools with needy students and, um, and highly diverse student populations. Teacher responsiveness and encouragement is also associated with reports of student success. Such observed changes are often explained as a talk story approach, even when observations occurred on the mainland in various states and in foreign classrooms. In Hawaii, talk story usually means everyone willingly participates in any way they can talk themselves into it and stay in it. How teaching can build use of this compelling approach, especially with needy and diverse students, is now studied widely. Since it appears that local classrooms will soon return to in-person teaching, there is an opportunity for teaching practice to benefit from these findings to assist teachers' enormous task to bring back all students to success in school. Our experts are here to explain more about this kind of talk, talk, talk power approach and also its implementation, how to influence uh, teachers to be skilled this way in the classroom with their students. Um, our experts are welcome today, and uh, we have Dr. Ronald Gallimore, who is emeritus uh, from UCLA and formerly um, a, a UH Manoa professor. He's um, studied the, the Hawaiian culture on the Leeward Coast uh, years ago, and uh, has, that has been foundational research for developing and implementing teacher practices to serve the needy, diverse students of Hawaii. Dr. Bryant is our other expert. He is an associate professor in the Department of Teacher Education and at BYU, but he's unfortunately in Provo, Utah, instead of Honolulu or actually Honolulu. But um, he, um, his work focuses on sustaining uh, equitable teaching practices in math teaching in rural Mexico and to enable equitable classroom talk in uh, the low income schools here on Oahu. In Hawaii. So welcome to both of you. Thank you for participating in the show. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to take a look at a fourth grade um, videotape as soon as I ask each of you two questions, which um, maybe you can be give us a little um, over well, a little uh, what structured, not a structured overview, but a little statement about what we're going to be seeing. The, the teaching that we're going to see is the um, talks, talk, powerful talk approach. And the label of this approach, to use it in classroom, is uh, now called instructional conversation. Dr. Gallimore, Ron, has been instrumental in, in having, making this happen here. And I wanted to ask him, why is it called instructional conversation? It's actually uh, intentional that it uh, sounds contradictory. Because most people, when they think instruction, think of a teacher-directed lesson in which teacher uh, talks most of the time and the students are responding. Teacher asks questions, the students respond. Conversation implies a two-way conversation, a discussion in which there are uh, less focus on a hidden agenda in the mind of the teacher or the, uh, uh, one of the speakers as so much as an exchange of ideas. So it is deliberate. Now, 
it came to be called this back when the Kamehameha schools was operating a laboratory school. And we were looking for ways to improve the reading achievement of native Hawaiian children. What we just saw was the children came from a background where talk story was very common. And in talk story, everybody gets to jump in, contribute, uh, put together a story, uh, each member of the conversation contributing to it. And through a series of exploration, we discovered that we could use that to teach reading comprehension if, if the teacher let the students control the turns, the, who got to speak, which is like talk story. Nobody in a talk story has to be called on to speak. Whereas in a typical lesson, teachers are calling on students to speak. But the big trick we discovered was if the teacher controlled the topic and used questions and other comments to keep the students on the topic, and let the students control the turns, you ended up with a conversation that was instructional. The teacher directing the topic, but the students controlling the turns. And out of that came a rich supply of ideas and constructions that the students could use in their reading lessons and in their writing. That's interesting. Yes, very, very uh, well described and certainly kind of a paradox. Yeah, instructional conversation, at least the way we've always uh, thought of it. So I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Jensen Bryant now about um, the label that that he's in uh, using uh, for this kind of teaching approach. And his label is Equitable Classroom Talker, ECT. So Brian, can you tell us a little bit about what that means and how, how it's developed this idea for me? Yeah, I would say that, you know, we haven't landed on one label. <laughs> we're sort of exploring labels and we're trying to build on the rich, long 50 year history of instructional conversation another work on dialogic teaching by folks like Courtney Kasdan and Bud Meehan and others. Um, there are two challenges that we're really trying to work on um, to extend the work of instructional conversations. One is to address issues of equity. Um, and by that, we mean whose lives are represented in the talk, whose uh, lives are um, discussed and how are their assets brought to bear in the conversation. Um, and the second challenge we're trying to address, and this figure speaks to this challenge, is how to realize and sustain implementation of this talk ac across a variety of classrooms. And so that's, you know, I'm working on this with colleagues at UH Manoa and other places like uh, Dr. Lois Yamauchi, um, our family, uh, my, my wife and five kids will be there in uh, Oahu, July to December, and we're working in some of the schools, including on the leeward coast and in the northern area there in Oahu. And we have a hypothesis that if we can create these formative measurement systems, as was shown in that figure, um, we, can, we can sustain the implementation of this type of talk better. One right. that's grounded in these in, in rich concepts, gives teachers information direct from the teaching, and provides guidelines for using that information in teams to sustain the implementation over time. So, that that's something we're we're working on, and it's a, a hypothesis I plan to pursue for the next several decades. So <laughs> it goes on and on. So I think that this uh, structure or restructuring of uh, uh, notion of what's happening in these interactions in classrooms it's it's a very good picture to have in our heads as we watch the tape. Heavy stuff was me to the east side. <laughs> How do you feel about your grandmother? Good. good. Oh. What do you mean good? Because we had a good day. She blood keeps blood. on helping me, and she said, The more you practice, you're going to get 100%. So I don't know what my grandpa feels because my grandpa. No, how do you feel about your grandmother? Good. Good, because she will not blow my mother. My mother will blow me. Okay, so I hear you saying that you feel good about her because she seems to assist you with things. Yeah. So. Any other reason you feel good about your grandmother? Uh, she cooks dinner for us. Uh, she always spends money on us. Buying her <gasps> yeah. mm. So she gives you presents or things? Yeah. yeah. She buys a lot of presents. Because she never sees you for a long time. She lives with us. <laughs> <laughs> 
Could you describe your grandmother to me? Curly hair. Oh, curly hair. Black. Black. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, Hawaiian. 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 <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, she wear, uh, shorts. Uh, she wear a shirt. She wears a shirt. I don't know. I never seen her when I was small. You've never seen your grandmother, John? Only when I was small. You don't remember anything about her? No. She what about your grandpa? Maybe. Why might she change, Noah Lani, Getting, from when he I'm knew right her there. when he was a little kid to now? Oh, She's him? Old. <laughs> ah, so your grandmother is old. Yes. And over time, the grandmother would get older. older. What older. shows signs? How, how do you know when your hair grandmother's get. getting old? No, her, the, she gets gray hair. Her face gets wrinkled. wrinkled. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way they talk. And they cannot oh. hear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you see some physical changes in them, like their hair green. Yeah, and no, they're, they're not like I'm You also go, you also go to Las Vegas, people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so your grandfather's pretty active, huh? He doesn't show. He always them. brings silver dollars. Yeah, you like to call some. Yeah, yeah, take them. <laughs> <laughs> so does your grandfather seem old to you? Uh, no. No. no, he's 86, <laughs> but he's any kind. <laughs> so why, guy? even though he's 86, why don't you think of him as an older man? Because he's, he's actually young. He's young. He's actually young. So what, what do you do to act active. young? Ah, oh, he does lots of things and he, he, that yeah. old he people usually bike. don't do. What might keep an older person healthy and active? <laughs> Eat right food. 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 Live happily. Uh, yeah. Um, Anytime he goes out, I like glass of milk. I go. Body properly. Yes, he goes. And then any time we go to our seals, I have a lot of and says, oh, can I have juice? And he goes, oh, no, that's the only thing I have. <laughs> okay, and you also said something. What did he say his grandfather does? Smoke quite. Smoke no, about uh, visiting. Where does he oh. go sometimes? He goes to Las, Las Vegas. Vegas. Why do you think he does that? No. Play poker. He well, gets up money oh. to travel. And he, um, he likes to play. Okay, oh. so that's kind of like his what? Maybe um, hobby. Maybe like hey, thank you. Okay, great. I, uh, I think that uh, we showed that out of context. You know, of course, that's part of a much, much larger lesson. Um, and we just wanted to present uh, the situation so that it could be kind of freshly commented upon by um, Ron, who has worked with this long and hard, and, um, and, and then by Brian. So, so Ron, would you say a few things about what just went on and what we see there that is interesting for our purposes? of uh, dialogic teaching and how it might be different from traditional directed uh, reading lessons? Well, uh, first of all, you know, I've watched a lot of video of lessons. And one thing I learned is you miss a lot if you don't look at it a lot of times. So I think many of your uh, uh, people visiting the podcast, Stephanie, are going to look at that and wonder what the heck was that? And what, what was the point of it? And some people will see one thing and another. But uh, let, before I mention the context of this, one thing about this is, this is also a language learning lesson. Th these students were being, if you'll notice, the teacher never criticized the way the students expressed themselves, never. She focused entirely on the message or the content of what they're trying to say. And then she helped them by asking questions and making other verbal moves to help them express more fully the thought they were trying to express. And in that, they are learning a way of speaking that is more in the academic sense. She spoke in full sentences. She used full questions. She did follow up. She didn't jump from topic to topic. She kept focusing in on one thing, bringing the students back. So when somebody brought up Las Vegas, she didn't say, no, no, we're not talking about that today. She said, she built on it. She used it. And all this time, these students are hearing her speak standard English in full sentences. So there's a learning process going on there. Now, the context of this was... I just say that it's so good you said that, because if you look at it, I would expect someone not familiar with this and not seeing it multiple times. It looks like a completely social situation. And no. what you're pointing out is yes, it is that at one level, but there's much more going on here. And in fact, we have researched this and documented that over the course of a year, students having these kind of conversations actually acquire a greater vocabulary, 
a wider vocabulary. They begin to use more complex sentence structures. If they have these kind of opportunities for a focused conversation where the teacher keeps them on the focus uh, on the topic and keeps pulling out of them a more elaborated version of their idea. Now, the context here is after this lesson, they're going to be asked to write a story about their grandparent. So she is really helping them generate a whole lot of ideas, which they will then write about. And then they'll use that writing they did to build vocabulary and to learn more about English and grammar and spelling and all the rest of it. So the meaning to them that it's about their grandparents will be used as motivation to learn about things about the English language. Yes, very interesting. And of course, many other activities will develop out of this. And this is one lesson, a piece of one lesson within a whole week of a unit. Okay, so Brian, Brian, what is it that you see there that relates to your emphasis um, of observe, observing teaching? Yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of good teaching that happens there, right? The, the teacher is um, letting students talk. There's, it's very multi-voiced, right? She's not correcting them. She's, um, the students, if you listen closely, use uh, some of their everyday language, like when they're, the boy on, um, on the upper part of the frame is uh, citing his grandfather. He uses some Hawaiian pigeon in there, and it's, it's really wonderful. She's not correcting that, and there are points where she restates what the children say while extending and giving new words, right? So it's just wonderful teaching. Um, I think... Uh, all of those things are really important. You would never expect in a three minute clip to see every feature of, of classroom discourse that you would want to see. It wouldn't be you know, feasible, right? But um, I think one thing that's important to me is, is that the talk is communal, meaning that yes, it needs to have some direction from the teacher, but in that three minute clip, there was only one brief moment where there was peer to peer talk. The rest of the talk was all peer or was all student to teacher and teacher to student. And so um, that's really important because there were the, the, the female students weren't as vocal in that three minute clip. And again, it's three minutes, right? Who knows what happens before and after as, as Dr. Gallimore just explained. But uh, for talk to really be equitable, for it to enhance opportunities to learn for every student in the classroom, there needs to be opportunities for all students to take initiative and for them to identify with one another's well-being and ideas. So more peer conversation is, is really important. Um, well, I think that's a really good point that you make and uh, uh, certainly a marker of uh, the nature of that, that work, which is a communal e experience of talking. And uh, I think that there's some other things going on in there too, which, which I, I, I think most people would notice if they were seeing this for the first time, and it relates back to Ron's initial point about controlling um, turns or controlling topic. And there were no hands raised, uh, that all of the participation uh, was uh, um, jet coming through a natural method, even though the teacher may you know, do, do some uh, physical things to bring people on. But I think that it kind of pulls from that initial point that Ron made and that these students are used to this because students take a while to not be, they, they take a while to get out of this hand raising and structured conversational uh, arrangement. So maybe what we can do right now is go take a look at um, the next um, clip. And um, I know we have a question, but we'll get to it in a minute. But if we take a look at the next clip, it, it moves along to kind of a different looking conversation, but it has, um, it, it has a focus more on the, act, the text material and the discipline or the content of the work. So what we've already seen was mostly an experience-based conversation and a vocabulary development and a participation uh, experience of confidence building and um, comfort in the role of speaking about um, uh, learning material. So in this one, we'll see uh, something that's a little bit different. Was what? Brandon, can you restate what the problem is? The principal didn't allow people playing soccer anymore. Okay, the principal didn't allow anyone to play soccer anymore. Okay, is that what we said, or did you want to add something? I think that's the problem. Okay, the, the principal didn't allow anyone to play soccer anymore. 
anyone to play soccer anymore. That is the problem, right? That we're going to deal with right now. Now, so then what happened? What was one of the actions? Now, what could you do? Did you just have to get it all from your head, or no, where you could can you? Go back to the text. Okay, so you can go back to the text and look. What was one of the actions, Dr. Trell? Um, that a girl start taking over the field. The girl start taking over. Okay, are you talking about what happened during the soccer game, or what happened after? After they couldn't play soccer anymore. Well, they couldn't play soccer anymore, right? No. So then, what happened? The what, okay, do you remember who told the class that um, the principal took away soccer? Um, Julia. Um, who you didn't think? Go ahead. Mr. Flores. Mr. Flores. And who's Mr. Flores? The, the teacher. The teacher. Okay, so Mr. Flores, do you remember, Dontrell, when the teacher said that they're not going to be able, that the principal took away soccer at recess? Oh, yeah. Okay, now you're getting it. Okay. So the principal took away soccer, and Mr. Flores is telling the class. Was the class happy about that? No. No, they weren't. Because were they? a lot of the kids played soccer. Right, recess. right. And so what what action did the class take to solve that problem? They, they, one of them was the, the studio tried to convince the uh, principal, and <coughs> he tried to find a, he tried to think of ways that would that people could also get hurt. That's the solution. That's what he used to get it. Okay, so you would put that further down here. What would what was you got? Can you think back, or you can look again in your text to try to find what was the first thing that they did when they found out that they couldn't play soccer anymore? They were um, mad and. They were thinking of things that people could get hurt, like the girls jumping rope. Mm -hmm. Okay, now was that during that's that was in the class, kind of or was I that said. part of when the principal when they were in the principal's office? That was in the principal's office, wasn't it? Okay, so let's think. What did they do after they they found out that they can't play soccer anymore? So they got they, upset. They got upset and they tried to. They went to his office. And who went to the office? Julio and his friends who played soccer. Okay, thank you. I mean, I, this is a, to a totally different group of students with different skills and a rather um, mixed group. Um, and I know it's just a taste of it, but just to show other students a little bit older and a little more focused on the content, not that the other one wasn't focused on the content because it was eventually going to lead into that. But um, tell me what you see going on here um, in general and in relation to the idea and the notion in, or to each other. So um, Ron, would you like to comment on uh, what's happening with these kids? Uh, this is a more uh, uh, direct instruction uh, uh, or direct comprehension lesson in which the teacher is uh, using a uh, protocol or a template to break down the story. And you would guess maybe these uh, readers are uh, needing to work on their comprehension. They're having trouble putting the, the details and the facts of the story together. Um, and so I, I would call this a more directed lesson. It's less conversational and more uh, instructional with a teacher both controlling the topic and the terms. So it's, it, it is a contrast and, you know, there's no, you know, at least in our work, there was never any contradiction that you had to do one or the other. That, that's, I, I thought it was a fallacy that depending on the students and on the point in the learning trajectory of students, you would use different instructional methods. Well, she, this teacher was working, uh, and, and she was beginning her work in instructional conversation and had, you know, worked on this to make sure she, she moved um, more towards a combination of style. looking at the participation of the students. If you see the whole tape, of course, there's much more to see in the way that she supported them and encouraged them and brought, brought them around to feel uh, as, as uh, engaged in, in the work. And all of them, even though they were at very different levels, they uh, were very productive for the, for the lesson. So, um, Brian, Brian, how did that look to you? I think one of the things we were trying to do with the notion of equitable classroom talk, or we've also called it instructional conversations for equitable participation, is to apply principles of 
um, equitable talk for content learning that can really transcend classroom setting. You know, uh, traditionally the instructional conversation was pretty scripted in terms of where the students were, like it was all small group center based. And that, that made, I think, implementation onerous for some teachers. And so obviously small group is the best to sort of experience all of the features of equitable classroom talk. But I think even in a direct, more directed lesson like this, you can see some features. For example, um, we saw peers responding to each other. You notice that one student shared a thought and then the female student corrected him and said, actually, it's this, right? And, and there was a sort of shared ownership of the idea. It wasn't like they were competing for, you know, who's right, who's wrong. They were building on each other's ideas and there was no sort of vying for teacher's attention. And so even though this was a directed uh, to sort of lesson by the teacher, comprehension lesson, I would argue that there were features of communal talk there. Um, where there was more peer engagement with ideas in their talk. So that's really important for equity. Well, is there anything you'd like to say with regard to your visual, Bryant, that uh, you can see um, from, from these two experiences of uh, communal talk? Um, what, what, does, what does your visual help us understand? Yeah, I mean, so... A lot of this builds on the work that Ron and others have done on teacher learning, right? So, you know, we know that teacher learning needs to be peer facilitated. We know that teachers, you know, fail to implement equitable classroom talk, not because they don't want to do it or because they resist, but because they don't have the support they need to improve implementation over time. And that support needs to be well-structured settings for teachers to engage with each other using information, data from their practice to improve. We argue that that data should be not only student data, but direct data on teaching through observation systems, student surveys, teacher surveys, and that that data on teaching should inform teachers' inquiry in these job-alike teams, especially around something as complicated as equitable classroom talk. You know, uh, improving is, is a process rather than a destination, and teachers need more support to get there. And our hypothesis is, th is that a formative measurement system um, as described in that figure, is is a is a promising way to get there. Uh, is there, yeah, an economically efficient way to get that time together to do that. Maybe um, how do we do that with teachers? I think um, that implementation part of it, Ron, you've you've thought about that, and Brian, you've talked about learning groups. Well, and, and one of the points I want to make is by asking Brian a question. All that process you talk about where they get the data, they work together and improve, who should be driving that? The teachers or somebody who's supervising them? The teachers, peer facilitated. And I mean, it, they may need some help, right? I think the challenge has been with instructional conversations is like um, it can rely a lot on external expertise. And some of that's helpful. but you know, the, the materials that we give to teachers should be self-sustaining in two ways. It should support peer facilitation so that teachers want to do it. It doesn't feel something imposed. They're agentive in their own improvement rather than worrying about being compliant. And secondly, that uh, teachers really need um, information in and from their practice to improve it, right? It, it can't just be based on some, you know, external curriculum. They need information like a classroom video, um, like in, an observation system, that they can quickly identify what to improve and how um, together. Okay, thank you. That's very good. Uh, Ron, we do have a question. Um, I think uh, briefly, uh, you can probably come up to it from your, with your background, which is so broad, but um, their question is, can this talking method be used with mute students? With new students? Mute, mute, M-U-T-E, mute students. I, I think not, not deaf students. At first I thought it was deaf students, but, that, but this, these would be mute students. How would you? Well, I would assume that? that using American Sign Language or some other uh, verbal form, it would work. I, I, I think there's been some work on that actually. Mm -hmm. uh, not up to date on it, but I think somebody actually tried doing that. So okay. yeah. 
Well, that's uh, very interesting. And uh, thank you both so much for some your insights and your um, findings and your thoughtfulness in looking at these interactions, which uh, what are, are tremendous efforts by uh, practitioners um, and teachers are all stars who uh, to go into, you know, such a, such an experience with their students. And most teachers once into it find that it is the heart of their teaching because they have this intimacy with students that they can't really have just by playground talk. So um, appreciate you bringing the academic uh, structure to it uh, and, and your, your uh, visual is helpful to start thinking about that. We're just scraping the surface here. So maybe we need to have some more talk about this as uh, we find out that, that the interest is there. And certainly um, this work, I did ask that last question about the economic efficiency, because of course with coming up, our students are so far behind, but our budgets are so low. So the kind of thing you're talking about, Brian, of teachers working together and being peer assisted, and maybe that this kind of staff self-development is, is possible without an expenditure issue because uh, that has to be taken into consideration too with these budgets so depleted through this pandemic. Thank you so much. Um, we're we're um, at the aloha moment, aloha time to wrap up. And uh, we've uh, this this is the show, the state of the state of Hawaii. And uh, we've been talking with doctors uh, Ronald Gallimore and Bryant Jensen about the strengths of classroom teaching that is talk based and equitable can bring to the um, success of our students in our schools. I'll see you again in two weeks on the state of the state of Hawaii. Mahalo for your attention, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>